Good morning, Fellowship Greenville. My name is Jim, and I am one of the pastors here at Fellowship Greenville. Uh, thank you so much for being here to worship Jesus with us. Uh, hello, Auditorium One across the way. You guys look beautiful as usual. <coughs> if you are new here with us, we're very happy to have you. If you have any questions about life here at Fellowship, you can stop by guest services out in the commons, and we have a team there that would love to help you in any way that they could. And members and regulars, you know the drill. Go to our team out at Next Steps if you have any questions about getting further involved. <clears throat> also, on that note, uh, we love that so many of you are at different levels of involvement here, and we believe that an important step in that process is church membership. And so we wanted to let you know that our next membership class is Sunday night, May First, and all the information that you need to know about that can be found on the website. I think you can even click the little uh, the, the QR code on the back of the chair there if you wanna take a picture of it. It can take you there, <clears throat> membership class, May 1st. Wherever you are in your journey of trusting Jesus and wherever you are in, your, in finding a place to belong with his people, uh, we are glad that you are here and we think um, that means God is up to something. Now, as many of you know, we are currently in a series called uncompromising faith, which is all about the days of the judges in the Old Testament. Last, uh, this is our last week in the actual book of Judges, and next weekend we will set aside time to celebrate Jesus' death and resurrection as the center of our faith. <clears throat> and then we will do four weeks on the book of Ruth because her story begins with the phrase, in the days of the judges, and is meant to be read with all these judges stories in view. <clears throat> now we're calling our series Uncompromising Faith because like Israel, that is precisely what we are called to. And sadly, at the time when this was all written, Israel was often found conforming to cultural norms and narratives rather than to God's standards. They canonized how they thought about religion and politics and ethics and even family life sometimes. They acted like their barbaric Canaanite neighbors rather than the set-apart people of God, and much can be learned from their waywardness. So today, I have the absolutely asinine task of preaching the last five chapters of Judges in one sermon, which is ridiculous, but these five chapters are meant to be understood together as the sad ending of the book of Judges in Fear not, we're not, we don't have time to read the whole thing, but if you wanna turn in your Bibles to Judges chapter 17, I promise we'll start there in a few minutes. Judges chapter 17. <coughs> Judges 17. Um, as you're finding your way there, you can stick your finger there or, or stop there on your scrolling device or whatever. Um, I don't know about you, but I think that parenting is one of God's most hilarious and brilliant and humbling ideas. Parenting, <clears throat> ready for this? Parenting is like humility because if anybody tells you they got it figured out, they are the walking punchline to a joke they don't know is being told, okay? <clears throat> That's the deal. Nobody bats a thousand at parenting. And so I detest unsolicited parenting advice, so here's some, okay? <clears throat> so th this... This might be subpar. Um, and even if it's true, you have to be careful how you, you tell your kids this. So <clears throat> here it is. Here's uh, Jim's probably iffy parenting proverb. Here it is. You ready? <clears throat> hey, sweetie. Hey, buddy. Hey, uh, <clears throat> guess what? You cannot be whatever you want to be. You can't do whatever you want to do. The world is not your oyster. <laughs> Isn't that so sweet and encouraging? I bet they, your kids really feel built up if you drop that on them, right? <clears throat> now, this might sound like, duh, like it might sound like a big obvious, but <clears throat> I, I need to flesh it out. I just need to. Like, if your kid is in high school, they should give up on their dream of becoming middle school spelling bee champion. They should just stop it. If your daughter's 16, she cannot win the Mrs. South Carolina pageant. She can't even compete, okay? Now, you have to know this, son. You can't play for the Charlotte Hornets when you're 13. And no, sweetie, you can't be a real-life mermaid. It's just not gonna happen. You can't fly on your own, hold your breath for an hour, or stay awake for a week straight. And you will be the worst parent ever if you tell your kid, hey, you keep running, and one day you'll be as fast as a car. You know why? Because that's a sack of dumb. It doesn't work. It's not real. <clears throat> it's just not real. 
Now, I, I, look, I don't know how some of this lands on you. Maybe some of you are like, well, I do tell my kids they can be whatever they, look, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm saying I want to think about that idea. But I will say that if you tell them <clears throat> literally what they can't be or do, I think you're giving them healthy and rational expectations for life. I mean, obviously the other stuff of love and compassion and, and you know, positive reinforcement and all that other stuff. But also, the older they get, I think you can actually specify this to each kid because you get to know them. Like, yeah, bro, you're not gonna be a professional athlete. Maybe a professional mathlete, but not an athlete. And sweetie, you are not, I love you so much. You're not gonna be a journalist. You're not gonna be a mechanic. You're not gonna be a fill in the blank. Now, lest you think this is just Jim impractically running his mouth, we have to consider the fruit of this. Like, if you did tell your kid that, or maybe you didn't, like, What would become of them after they uh, leave the nest? How does what you tell your kids shape them as they grow up? I had two conversations on back-to-back days a while back uh, with two different people in their 20s. Two different people. The first 20-something said the most mature and wise and biblical thing. They said, you know, I, I am finding so much joy and so much freedom in my God-given limitations. There's such rest there. <clears throat> like, I don't have to spend myself trying to be something I'm not. I can be present. Whew, I'd give anything. I can be present wherever God has me. I can breathe. I can be really happy and satisfied with the simplicity of what God has called me to, to love him and love others. Now we can just pack it up and go home. That's the sermon, you know? That's it. Now, that's great. That's amazing. But now, compare and contrast that with what this other 20-something said to me. They said, you know, anything can happen. There are endless options out there. Like, I know that I can do anything I set my mind to. Anything. You, you know you're the only one who limits you, Jim. If, if you believe it, you can achieve it. You can do it. Your dreams aren't dreams for no reason. And then they threw in a couple more like <clears throat> bad motivational hashtags like shoot for the skies, live your truth, anything is possible if you stay focused, like some <clears throat> stuff like that. And maybe this is just a difference of personality, but to me that sounds exhausting, okay? Completely deflating. That meaning and purpose and truth and achievement and life and fulfillment all rest on me and the buck stops with me. That's a recipe for disaster. Even the great uh, Greek philosopher Jim Carrey totally agrees. He says, I wish everybody could get rich and famous and have everything they ever dreamed of so that they could know that it's not the answer. Right? Now, there might still be a few of you who are like, type A, let's go, let's do it, I get four hours of sleep a night. Like, if that's you, you're like, wait a second, and you wanna wanna push back a little bit, here's where I'm with you, okay? Here's where I'm totally with you. Absolutely, we need to be diligent, we need to be prudent, we need to be faithful, we better be loving and responsible and creative. It's great, it's not wrong, it's great to plan and to dream and to strategize, but if you are a follower of Jesus, We're called to do these things as an extension of our trust in him and not a replacement of it. Because on our own, we simply can't be and do whatever we want. And those are just the facts. And if you try to live there, it'll get ugly. Let me try to comb it out a little bit. Let's say you pursue your dreams and you go live your truth. And it's awesome. It's awesome for a while, really is. But then you bump up against somebody whose personal dreams and perception of truth are in direct opposition, direct collision course with yours, then what happens? Let's say you go live however you want, you do whatever the heck you want, and you become over time your first priority, and then you realize that your decisions have hurt other people who are actually attempting the same. Then what do you do? Now, if you haven't picked up on this, this is absolutely 100% a direct commentary on our current cultural climate, absolutely. This, and I love it, is an iPhone. It's not a you phone, it's not an us phone. Every single day, this thing whispers to me, just say it, I'm in charge, I rule the world, I make it go round. 
That's what this kind of thing does. <clears throat> and the reason, we gotta get this, the reason that our world today prizes tolerance as such an ultimate virtue is because it's the result of people pursuing their own agendas first and then realizing they should probably do something when it collides with other people's agendas. I love what N.T. Wright says that biblically speaking, tolerance is a parody of the biblical virtue of patience. <clears throat> but it's still true. This is still the world we live in. Hey, you do you. Live your truth. <clears throat> Pursue your dreams. Do it, go. And on the surface, like, it sounds, it just sounds kind of cute. But it's actually, it's a gateway drug. And guess what it leads to? Collision, confusion, chaos, despair, depression, anger and abuse, violence and vice. When people live in the lane of, I'm gonna do whatever I wanna do, they slowly, consciously or subconsciously, demonize anybody who isn't in or getting in their lane. And over time, the result is that the individual becomes their own God. And when that's the case for every single person, the result is hate on top of hate on top of hate on top of hate. Now, some of you might be thinking, <clears throat> I know the world is so lost and broken and fragile and sad right now. And I, I agree with you. I absolutely agree with you. Some of you might be <clears throat> thinking, like you might be projecting, oh, he's primarily describing the people of the political party I don't vote for, and if they only knew what I knew, we'd be, we'd be covered, right? <clears throat> we'd be in good shape. But here's what I wanna tell you. For the past two months, <clears throat> for the past two months, do you know what Judges has been saying to us? That these things are actually most corrupt when they happen amongst God's people. When we think we can run the show on our own. Most corrupt when they happen among us. 150 years ago, <clears throat> Charles Spurgeon said, the worst evils, the worst evils that have ever come upon the world have been brought upon her by an unholy church. Dude, I just want, want to sit on that. But I think he's talking about things like slavery and the Crusades, but retroactively, Judges is further proof that I think Spurgeon is spot on. And this is why the book of Judges ends the way that it does, with a single line commentary, yes, on the last five chapters we're about to look at, but this single line also serves as a banner over the entire book of Judges. It says, in those days, there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Since we're gonna be coming back to this today, uh, let's read it out loud together. Uh, here we go, read it with me, here we go. In those days, there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. That was six out of 10, I need a little more from Auditorium One, here we go one more time. In those days there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And oddly, today this is God's word for us, his people. Now, if that is the diagnosis, right? That's the diagnosis, that we think the world is our oyster and what is right is whatever I choose to do, then what's the remedy? Like what's the solution? How can we be free from the slavery of living for self. Like when God <clears throat> brought Israel out of slavery from Egypt, he called them, it says in, in, in Exodus four, he called them his firstborn son. And when he gives them the law, the Torah, he sits, it's like he sits them down as their father and he lovingly says, hey buddy, you, you can't be whatever you wanna be and you can't do <clears throat> whatever you wanna do. And the book of Judges is God's people going, watch me trying to prove them wrong. <clears throat> That's what we have throughout the book of Judges. So today's question is, <clears throat> what is the remedy? What is the solution for only living from our own perspective? That's what the language of the eyes is all about, perspective. Doing what is right, and here's the, man, this is tough. Doing what is right in our own eyes, it feels like freedom, but it's actually a prison, right? And so we need to look at Judges 17 to 21 and consider this. What is the remedy for only living from our perspective? That's what we're going to think about today. And sadly, especially given the content of these chapters, we can't rush 
to the conclusion. We have to see how it functions and breathes so that we can be aware of it and so that our answer will make more sense. So in order to start, Judges 17, let's just look at the first six verges, uh, verses of Judges chapter 17. <coughs> Judges 17, starting in verse one, here we go. There was a man <coughs> of the hill country of Ephraim whose name was Micah, and he said to his mother, the 1,100 pieces of silver that were taken from you, about which you uttered a curse and also spoke it in my ears. Behold, the silver is with me. I took it, meaning he, he stole from his mama. That's what that means. And his mother basically said, it, it really is in Hebrew, like it, it's sarcastic. His mother basically said, oh, bless your heart, God bless you. Like that's basically <clears throat> what she does. And he restored the 1,100 pieces of silver to his mother. And his mother said, I dedicate the silver to Yahweh from my hand and for my son to make a carved image and a metal image. Now, therefore, I will restore it to you. Verse four. So when he restored the money to his mother, <clears throat> his mother took 200 pieces of silver, gave it to the silversmith who made a carved image and a metal image. And it was in the house of Micah. And the man Micah had a shrine and he made an ephod. That's like a priest jacket and household gods, and he even ordained randomly, not because of God's call, he ordained one of his sons to be a priest. And, verse six, in those days, there wasn't a king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. <clears throat> now, um, this story might not seem like much, but we have to zoom out a little bit to, to, re to really understand what's going on here. The authors of Judges are assuming a lot out of us as we wade into these last five chapters. They're actually assuming <clears throat> that we know the first five books of the Bible really well, uh, Torah. And you know why? Because out of these just few verses, you know what Micah does? He breaks six out of the 10 commands. He does, he breaks six out of 10 commandments. No other gods, don't make idols, use Yahweh's name in vain. He dishonors his mama because he stole from her, probably because he was coveting. Six out of 10 in just a few verses. And the 1,100 pieces of silver is a throwback to the Samson story from last week. And if you remember, 10 pieces of silver is a yearly salary. <clears throat> and if we just say that a yearly sal salary is $45,000 a year, what you have here is Micah stealing $5 million from his mama, which you should not do. Don't steal $5 million from your mama. Come on, Micah, what's your problem? <clears throat> now, the authors of Judges are also assuming something else about us as readers. They're assuming that we've been following the, the stories in the Judges <clears throat> all, all along. And since this is our last day in Judges, a brief overview is needed. Judges starts with two episodes <clears throat> of war and idolatry. And then for the next dozen chapters or so, we have 12 Judges that are mentioned and seven stories of judges that are told. So 12 in the Bible represents the people of God, and seven is the number of completion or wholeness. So the story of judges is how the people of God become completely and wholly devoted to themselves. There was a, theirs, theirs was a compromised faith throughout because the seven stories show a downward spiral of sin and of compromise and of rejection of God. And then we get to chapter 17 through 21, and here we have the inverse of the intro. It's not war, idolatry, it's uh, idolatry and then war. <clears throat> now, if you want a visual of that, this is how the book of Judges goes. Chapters one and two, war, idolatry. <clears throat> Chapters three to 16, 12 Judges, seven stories. Chapters 17 through 21, idolatry, war. And this whole thing is a perfectly imperfect downward spiral into sin. And the single line that describes it all started the Micah story and it ends the end of the five chapters, which is everybody did what was right in their own eyes. Now, <clears throat> again, you might be thinking, <clears throat> okay, I, I get it, shouldn't steal $5 million from your mama, <clears throat> you probably shouldn't make idols out of silver, <clears throat> you shouldn't do that, but Jim, it's not that bad, have you read the rest of the Old Testament? Yes, I agree that it might seem just like a trite little thing given of some of these other surrounding stories, but you need to buckle up because this is the tiny snowball on the top of the hill and it's gonna go down the hill into something else. Now, we don't have time to read it, but the rest of the idol episode in 17 and 18 goes like this. An entire group of people from the tribe of Dan, they come and they steal from Micah the stealer. And then, just like 
Micah did idol worship, they do idol worship, but it's worse because it's communal and more widespread. And it gets so out of hand because everybody is trying to live their best life now and live their truth and do their own thing. And look at how it ends in Judges, verse, Judges 18, verse 27. <clears throat> Maybe flip a page, Judges 18, 27. But the people of Dan <clears throat> took what Micah had made and the priest who belonged to him, and they came to Laish, a quiet and an unsuspecting people, meaning they were just chill, peaceful civilians. And the Danites struck them down with the edge of the sword and burned their city with fire. Again, thinking that you can be and do whatever you want sounds like a harmless tweet. It sounds like nothing. But then, <clears throat> when you give in to it and you live there, Guess what it leads to? It leads to conflict and confusion and anger and violence and hate upon hate. Now, <clears throat> that's just the episode of chapters 17 and 18. The episode in chapters 19 to 21 actually gets worse. <clears throat> and here, <clears throat> here's where you need, um, you need to trust me. Uh, <clears throat> side pastor confession. I love saying stuff out of the Bible, not of my own contriving. I love saying stuff out of the Bible that makes people go, what? Preachers aren't allowed to say that because it's in the Bible. I mean, I love that. I'm, gonna, I'm admitting that right now. <clears throat> I do love that. And I love that because we have over-sanitized life with God and we're so prone to make God in our own, own image and turn the Bible into this flowery, like, fairy tale. Um, but what happens in this last episode is so grotesque and horrifying that you can just go read it on your own. <clears throat> um, it's too graphic to mention here in detail. In fact, it's not only what is said that is so confounding, but how it's said. So like Israel, years before, chapters 19 through 21 are intentionally wandering in the literary wilderness. There's almost no order. It's deliberately enraging to read. <clears throat> Excuse me. It goes a little something like this. <clears throat> Pay attention. Now, I don't wanna repeat myself. I can't stand it when people say the same thing over and over and over and over again. You know why? You know why? <clears throat> because redundancy isn't helpful. It doesn't do anything for anybody. Like, what does it accomplish to say back the stuff that's already been said? Like, what does it do when you, when you do that? You're just a mirror of words? What are you? Like, what is achieved when you echo the things that have already been stated. It serves no purpose to, to, to like restate them or, or recap them or tell the thing that's already been told. Isn't that frustrating? <laughs> Isn't it? Isn't it? I hate it when people do that. You know, that kind of repetition, reduplication, reiteration of, of words that just drone on and on and on. That's the worst. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> <laughs> that is funny. Um, <clears throat> some of you are like, what is happening? What did he? <laughs> you know, more coffee. Um, <clears throat> now, <clears throat> uh, what you have to imagine <clears throat> is a hundred verses of that. And here's the sad thing. Not just filled with me making a point, but filled with lots of violence and bloodshed just to prove a terrifying point. Not just savage warfare, but civil war. This is the Hebrew people killing the Hebrew people, murdering one another. And this doubles down <clears throat> on the first episode of idolatry. Look at Judges 20, 48. You might have to do one more page. Judges 20, 48. <clears throat> 20, 48. And the men of Israel <clears throat> turned their back against the people of Benjamin, <clears throat> both Hebrew groups, and struck them with the edge of the sword, the city, men and beasts, and all they found in them, and all the towns that they found, they set on fire. Not just one city, every village they came to. And beyond this, and here's the part where you just need to trust me, and if you wanna read it later, you can read it later. These chapters <clears throat> record flagrant sexual corruption, sexual abuse, rape, and I think maybe the most appalling story of violence in the entire Bible. And then when we turn to the last page of Judges, the last line on the last page sums it all up in just a few words. After the grueling, gruesome maze of wandering for five chapters, <clears throat> the book closes with the, the simple line, <clears throat> 21, 25. In those days, there's no king in Israel. So everybody did what was right in their own eyes. So this final section, these final five chapters, it begins with that in 17 and it ends with it in 21. 
In those days, there's no king. In those days, there's no king in Israel. <clears throat> so everybody did what was right in their own eyes. So what do we do with this? It's not Ephesians again. <clears throat> this is heavy. Like what are these two episodes trying to teach us? How do they push us to answer our question about a remedy for only living from our own perspective? Now first off, <clears throat> if you still have questions and hesitations about the violence in scripture, I'm with you. Some of it can be so, so intense. Uh, Charlie did a great job talking about that stuff in his first judge's message, if you wanna go back and listen to that. Also, feel free to email me, and I'm happy to shoot some resources your way <clears throat> about those kinds of things, because I do know that they can be heavy. But specifically, <clears throat> how are these last five chapters trying to help us? Here we go. These chapters want us to know this, that any sustained attempt to be or do whatever we want will result in us hurting ourselves and hurting others. I know we only did the, <clears throat> the Micah part at the beginning of 17, but if you start with the beginning of 19, it's also just one dude. He's a nameless guy. Like it comes down to nobody who has a name in the beginning of chapter 19, and he begins just by doing his own thing, doing whatever he wants. And I feel like we've proven this point, but the book of Judges does not want us to feel this in the abstract. It wants us to feel it deep down in our gut. Any sustained attempt <clears throat> to be or do whatever we want will result in us hurting ourselves <clears throat> and us hurting others. And you know what we do? <clears throat> we, we do little versions of this. We try to hide and press down and conceal sin. We try to downplay it. We think that, oh dude, I can tell little lies here or there and nobody's gonna catch on. <clears throat> I can look at porn every once in a while because nobody's gonna catch me. I, you know what, it's fine to, to drink a little too much when nobody else is around. Or maybe that slow drip of gossip that you couch as a prayer request. Or the emotional adultery that you justify as friendship. Or the idol of comfort that I say is Sabbath or the idol of control that I just call responsibility. <clears throat> like, watch this, we convince ourselves, hey, God's gracious, those things are no big deal. Now, I pray that those things are just little speed bumps that we confess, that we own up to, and then we rest in God's forgiving love. I hope that's the case. But, Judges is telling us something. It's telling us <clears throat> that if you live there, if you live in those things, if those things become a rut, if you set the cruise control in the lane of those things, and over time they go unchecked, they will become, it's not a snowball anymore, they will become a self-justifying avalanche that will not only take you out, but also those around you. When the dam breaks, it's not just me that gets hurt. And at the root, at the very source of it, is us trying to do meaning and purpose out of thin air and on our own. And I pray, please, Holy Spirit, show us the ways in which the seed of this exists in us and please uproot it and take it out of our lives, purge it from us. Because these chapters are warning us about just such things. They want us to know that we were not made to each be the commanders of our own destiny. We're not supposed to do or figure out life on our own and any, any extended effort in that direction will backfire. So the first part of our answer is to just really truly and actually believe that living life from our own individual perspectives will get us in trouble. <clears throat> to, to really think <clears throat> that that's not talking about somebody else. That's what Judges wants us to think. But there's more. <clears throat> there is a positive answer to our question, and for this, we need to think a little bit more about the phrase right in their own eyes. <clears throat> so uh, maybe you remember last week, uh, we talked about Samson, he was the last judge. Do any, does anybody remember how Samson ended up with his eyes gouged out, hurting himself and others? <clears throat> you remember that? Samson is the forerunner to this final section, these final two episodes. So Samson's story and these two stories, from them all, we learned that the language about eyes <clears throat> is not only about perspective, we've mentioned that, but that it's also about standard. Like what we do is based on the standard or based on the standards that are set before us. And if we set or if we are those standards, that's when we're gonna be done in. 
In his superb commentary on Judges, Daniel Block writes the following. Guys, this is so good. Dan Block, Block writes, ironically, <clears throat> in a world in which the individual makes himself the measure of all things, the individual eventually counts for nothing. And to me, <clears throat> that heartbreakingly describes nearly everything in the news and on social media. And so now we're left to ask, well, what should be the, what should be the, the standard for all things? What should it be? And the verse says, <clears throat> there was no king in Israel, so everybody was right in their own eyes. And so the people at the time, they needed more than a seasonal tribal leader. They needed a definitive ruler and then we can go and we can read on in 1 Samuel and we will quickly discover that this means they needed to trust and serve and love and obey and worship Yahweh, God, as their true king. <clears throat> God needed to be their standard and who God is and what God does and what God says needs to be our standard today. And we see this <clears throat> as especially true if we turn the language about the eyes inside out and upside down. Meaning, Judges wants us to go, man, human eyes aren't getting the job done. What's the opposite of human eyes? Oh, God's eyes. So let's talk about what's right in his eyes. Let's talk about his perspective and him as the standard. <clears throat> Don't forget, the writer of Judges wants us, he expects us, they expect us to know about the first five books of the Bible. And on the first page of the Bible, guess what? Seven times it says that God saw with his eyes. And what did he <clears throat> see? He saw everything that he made and it was good and right and ripe and beautiful. And God's perspective is the right perspective. Like his standards are not about mindless submission or robotic legalism. <clears throat> they are about human flourishing. That's Eden, the Garden of Eden. Now, you ready for this? <clears throat> In contrast, guess the first time it mentions human eyes? Genesis chapter three. And they saw the tree and it was a delight to the eyes, and they took, same verb for Micah, took the silver from his mama, right? <clears throat> but God is too loving and too kind and too pursuing and too gracious to let humans have their own way, and he invites people to trust his promise that the mess that we have made of his world will not last. And when we trust his promise, guess what the Bible says? And Noah found favor in God's eyes. The psalmist prays, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. When David <clears throat> is anointed in 1 Samuel, it says the Lord doesn't see like people see. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks, he sees his eyes at the heart. And these thoughts on God's eyes help us wiggle free from the slavery of our own perspective. Now this is dense, but I just, forgive me, I tried to put the whole sermon in one sentence here. Uh, here we go, here we go. Viewing life from God's perspective and living life by God's standards guards us from unnecessary hurt and roots us in unshakable hope. Again, more slowly, there's this whole sermon in a nugget. Here it is. <clears throat> Viewing life from God's perspective and living life by God's standards guards us, protects us, defends us against unnecessary hurt <clears throat> and also roots us, strengthens us, anchors us in unshakable hope. Now, I wanna talk about the pieces of that, but this, this is our final answer. Hey, if the diagnosis is problematic because of our eyes, then the remedy, the solution is right and true and good because of God's eyes. That's where I'm getting this. And the reason the hope is unshakable here is because God is not a seasonal tribal judge who falls back into sin. That's what we've been dealing with for 21 chapters. Earthly, military, and political leaders with skewed agendas, but that is not God. God isn't like that. <clears throat> He's the unimpeachable king who knows what's best. He saw all that he made, and it was good. He knows the right perspective. He is the right standard, and that's why the hope we have in him can be immovable. <clears throat> and we can live in this hope and view life from his point of view by leaning into what he says is true. Jim, what does God say is true? Thanks for asking. We are his image bearers. We're called to reflect him, to enjoy him, to rely on him. <clears throat> Two greatest commandments in the whole Bible. Love God, love others. 
towards God, that's a posture of humility and obedience and willingness and trust. Towards others, that's a posture of compassion and care and service and love. People are not competition. People are opportunity to extend God's grace and love. Beyond this, we're meant to be a conversationally prayerful people. We are meant to be a confessional community, honest together as God's people. We're supposed to be people of the book, getting to know God's word and getting to know his story. We're meant to be a missionally minded people, inviting other people into life with God. And these are the kinds of things that give us his perspective. These are the kinds of things that show us his standards. And this is why, honestly, why we have things like core values, to remind you that you were made to be a part of something bigger than what you can dream up yourself. Charlie did it last week. <clears throat> God, not my story, but yours. God, not my agenda, but yours. <clears throat> not my plan, but yours. Not my design, but yours. Not my desire, but yours. And today, not what's right in my eyes, but yours. And if we keep going and we push it into the practical, God, how do I parent from your perspective and not mine? How do I do my job from your perspective and not mine? God, how do I do dating from your perspective and not mine? How do I do conflict from your perspective and, and not mine? How do I do money and how do I do friendship and how do I do politics and how do I do hobbies and how do I do all of these things from your perspective and not mine? Or as Jesus prayed, on his way to the cross, Father, not my will, but yours be done. And when we seek to be and do what God has made us to be and do, therein lies fulfillment and purpose and unshakable hope. Not in our opinion, our preference, our perspective, our standard, not in our hot take, not in our latest whimsical desire, in God's eyes, from his point of view, when we seek to live there in that space, that's where we find fulfillment and an anchor for our souls and a movable hope. And the supreme way that we know all this is true is because of Jesus. Jesus is God's perspective and God's standard in a person. He is who God is, what God does, and what God says with skin on, who lived among us. He is the word made flesh. And attempting to conjure up hope and happiness on our own by doing whatever the heck we want will undo us. The exponential hurt of trying to run our own lives will suffocate not only us, but others. But the gospel tells a different kind of story. It tells us that meaning and purpose and truth and fulfillment and achievement and life all rest on Jesus and not on us. And I'm down for that. I'm down for that. I don't wanna be exhausted by it because he exhausted it all on the cross. On the cross, he took all of my pride and my turned inwardness. He took all of our sin and our shame and our guilt and our separation from God that we deserve. He took it all into himself at Calvary. And now if we trust us, he offers us life beyond us. And that is exactly what we have to have. The equality and justice and peace that our world is aching for cannot be found in, hey, you do you, man, live your truth. It can't be found there. It doesn't matter how strong your desire is, how deep your pockets are, how much technology advances, or how it feels in the moment. The wholeness the justice, the peace that the world that we yearn for can only be found in Jesus healing our idolatrous hearts and taking all human violence into himself willingly and then turning around and offering us grace and forgiveness and eternal life. And I'm telling you, we know this stuff is true because Good Friday isn't the end of the story. Jesus passed through death and out the other side. And because of his resurrection, we can flip Judges 21, 25. In these days, we do have a king over God's people and he can show us what's right in God's eyes and that is eternal life. And now falling before Jesus as king and savior and friend is how we do our final answer. Friends, I wanna own this and I hope you do too, that tr trusting Jesus over trusting self frees us from the pressure of having to make our dreams come true. 
even if sometimes it sounds like this from the lips of our Lord. Deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. Fellowship Greenville, I pray so hard that that last line of Judges could not be descriptive of us. Rather, I hope that we do Hebrews 12 together. We fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. We fix our eyes upon him. Because in him, we have all we need, and that's really good news. I hope you believe that today. Let's pray together. Holy Spirit, we pray with the psalmist, open our eyes, Lord, that we would behold that which is good and true. Please, Holy Spirit, help us to see those things. And Jesus, we thank you so much that you, climactically and ultimately, you are what is good and true. And we, we jump in with Paul in 2 Corinthians 3 where he says, beholding the glory of the Lord Jesus, we are changed. That's what we want. So Holy Spirit, open our eyes to that, that Jesus would be irresistibly awesome and wonderful to us. Please, Jesus. Jesus, we thank you for the cross and the empty tomb. Jesus, we thank you for the grace upon grace upon grace that has overcome the hate upon hate upon hate that we have led into your good world. We just praise you for your love and your grace and your forgiveness. Jesus, we love you. You're the best. Amen.